who is a very, very, in a way, influential Buddhist master of China. And again, I would like to request uh, Venerable Pixuni Dr. C. Xu Hui to present her presentation on Master Yin Shun. You can do here on table or if you want more focal point over at dais. It is your choice. 20 minutes, I will warn you to wrap up for five minutes. Okay, you got 25 minutes, please go on. Microphone, please. Can you? There's a switch. If there's any switch, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before uh, before my presentation, I would like to recite uh, homage to the Buddha in my language. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Namo Ben Shi Shi Jia Mo Ni Fo. Good afternoon, venerable members of the Sangha and Dharma friends. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank you, Venerable Professor K. Uh, Dhamma uh, Sami and the Shan uh, State Buddhist University for this opportunity uh, to share my findings. I very much appreciate your uh, hospitality. Thank you very much. Mm. My, pipe, my paper is on uh, Master Ying Shun uh, and reading the Chinese Tripitaka in the changing times of modern, uh, of modern China. My paper is not working. Okay. It's not working. It's on the page number 72 in this book. Uh, my paper is uh, divided into four parts, life and background, uh, readings. Okay. You can carry reading on, of the let Chinese the technician do their work and then okay. you can carry on. Reading of the Chinese Tripitaka, perspective on the Chinese uh, Tripitaka and my conclusion, contemplating uh, reading. Uh, for the first two parts, I will do a PowerPoint presentation, and the last two parts, I will read from my uh, paper. You can find it in the conference proceeding. Yes, Venerable, you can go on, let the technician do his work. Okay. So otherwise, we will just waste our time, because sometimes the technical glitch is always have a problem when we need it. Mm -hmm. um, Master Ying Shun was born in a, a village. Okay, thank you. Thank you. He was born in a small village in uh, Hainan County, uh, Zhejiang province in southeastern China. Because he was born prematurely, he always looks pale and weak. Uh, he was a village boy from not wealthy family. He felt inferior and lonely in school and had an introverted uh, character. When he was teaching in an elementary school at the age of 16, uh, he read books in topics varying from the ancient Chinese philosophy to religious such as New and Old Testaments and Buddhism. He started reading more Buddhist texts and commentaries without any guidance because of his learning the Dharma. When his parents passed away, he had uh, thoughts of taking up the ropes. Uh, 
began his uh, monastic life. He went to Mount Putuo, uh, this place, islands, settled down uh, at a small site called Fu Quan Temple, and took up the ropes under Master Qing Nian at the age of uh, 24. After his ordination, he enrolled in one, uh, at one of the modern Buddhist uh, academies, uh, Minnan Buddhist Institute, set up by Master Tai Xu, uh, a leading figure among the progressive uh, Buddhist reformers. He was invited to teach his classmates after attending for about four months. After a few months of teaching, he felt that it was not ideal. He decided to return to Mount Puto and spend time reading Tripitaka in Huiji Monastery. Due to the ongoing warfare with Japan, he left Beijing and moved to the western region of Sichuan and stayed for eight years. Uh, he met Venerable Fa Jun, who studied in Tibetan, uh, Tibet and had contributed significantly to the translation of key Tibetan texts into Chinese. He and Venerable Fatun debated and discussed a, a variety of topics in Buddhist doctrines, and the latest view on Tibetan Buddhism deeply influenced Master Ying Shun, who would incorporate uh, them into his understanding of the Dharma. He regarded those years as the most meaningful time that had the most lasting impact on his thought. In 1952, he was invited to be one of the mental teachers at Shandang Monastery in Taiwan and became the abbot in 1956. He built a Fu Yan Vihara, a Buddhist uh, seminary in North Taiwan, and then Hui Re Semen Hall in Taipei, which he designated as the monastery that was solely for the function of preaching the Dharma. He wanted the two sites he built would become places for self-cultivation and Dharma propagation. He empathized with the nuns who did not have opportunities for learning the Dharma. He also set up a Buddhist nuns institute next to Fuyan Vihara. In 1964, he moved to Miaoyun, Aranya in southern Taiwan to have time for self-study and writing. This is an enclosed room for self-study. Uh, and then that one, uh, the corner that side is the uh, close-up of the glass window on the door, and meals were offered uh, to him from the window uh, on, the, on the door. After he resided in Taiwan, he traveled to countries in Southeast Asia to give Dharma talks. From the age of 26 until 93, he kept on writing articles and books. He was an exceedingly prolific writer. He motivated by the aspiration to comprehend doctrine so as to be able to perform the function of clarifying the Buddhist thought, he humbly depicted himself as only contributing to the Dharma while pursuing self-improvement through the Dharma. He passed away in 20, uh, 2005. Reading, this is the second session, reading of the Chinese Tripitaka. From 1932 to 1936, he stayed almost uh, entirely at the uh, Tripitaka Pagoda of Huizhi Monastery, Buddha Haig Mountain at Putuo. In those days, it was exceedingly difficult to come upon a set of Tripitaka, let alone read it. He was able to pursue the canonical readings singularly. Although the monastery was poor, it was the uh, most ideal place that he would ever have in his entire life. He read the Tripitaka, Dragon Tri Tripitaka of the Qing Dynasty in the daytime and continued to study three treaties and consciousness-only teachings at night. This Tripitaka contains then, uh, more than 7,000 fascicles. He needs to read seven or eight fascicles per day, and each fascicle contains about 9,000 words. He began first with the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, which numbered about 750 fascicles. He read word by word in detail and spent four months completing its reading. 
but he felt he still felt that he could not really have profound comprehension of the sutra. He discovered the vibrant variety of approaches to the Dharma, to the Buddha Dharma from his reading and felt that the Tripitaka is a tremendous Buddhist treasure that is inexhaustible. When he read the Agamas and various versions of Vinaya, he had a feeling of intimate familiarity with and the reality of the actual human world. They are different from certain Mahayana sutras that are presented in terms of faith and ideals. This discovery significantly influenced his future quest for the Buddha Dhamma. To him, reading the Tripitaka is not only for the merits of ritual chanting, but it is for the sake of understanding the Dharma, for enhancing our faith and inspiring our practice. He noticed that there are many texts that were either retranslated, synthesized, or are just similar. He suggested to have a fine selection of the Tripitaka and thus it will be more convenient for the scholar uh, who wish to study further the Dharma. Here, uh, the third session, pers uh, perspective on the Chinese uh, Tipitaka, I'll read from my uh, paper, is on page uh, 79. Uh, given linguistic constraints, Master Ying Shun's study was primarily focused on the Chinese uh, Tipitaka, which he read first in the Qing Dynasty uh, edition. In his later years, when he had settled down in county of uh, Taichung in central Taiwan, he would have access both to the Taisho edition of the Chinese Tripitaka as well as Chinese translation of the Pali Canon, which is referred to, that, uh, referred to as the Canon of the Southern Tradition. The Chinese Tripitaka was thus his lifelong subject of study. In his two articles, he uh, situates the Chinese Tripitaka. The, the two articles are um, status of the Chinese Buddhist canon in world Buddhism, and the other article is the Chinese Buddhist canon and world uh, Buddhist research. In these two papers, in these two essays, he uh, situates the Chinese Tripitaka among the other, ma other major Buddhist canons, namely the Pali Tripitaka and the Tibetan Tripitaka, and link them to the prevalent uh, rubric classification of Indian Buddhist history. Master Ying Sun assesses the place of the Chinese Tripitaka among the other major Buddhist canons as follows. The sacred canonical texts in Chinese language which are transmitted in China are of course not comparable to the original canonical texts recorded in Sanskrit or Pali, nor is it as close to the original canonical texts as the Tibetan translation. Nonetheless, if one is conducting a historical investigation to understand the uh, historical unfolding of changes of everything about Buddhism that originated from India, the Chinese translation would have there are unique values that cannot be overlooked. Values which are the Pali, Tibetan, and Sanskrit texts cannot compare to. He explained that while the Chinese Tripitaka is the canon of the um, middle period, the 10,000 years of Buddhist development in India did make their way into the Chinese uh, Buddhist translation. Furthermore, the Chinese Tripitaka also includes selected texts from the Tibetan and Pali canons that were translated into Chinese from the 13th to 17th centuries. In other words, the Chinese Tripitaka really contains uh, texts from all three periods of uh, Indian Buddhist thought and history and is particularly useful for amplifying the canons of the other two phases of Buddhist history. Also, the Chinese Tripitaka of, quite often contains more than one version of translation for the same text. The existence of variant versions of different chronological periods would help one to clarify the uh, translation history of Chinese Buddhism and the literary, phil uh, philosophical, and religious changes over time as recorded in uh, the different versions and recessions of the same text. 
uh, we skip this part and then we uh, go to page 82. Master Inshun argued for the urgency of studying the Chinese Buddhist canon within the context of what he referred to as world Buddhism. While it is true that uh, global implication harkens to the search for universals that is quite characteristic of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, I propose that Master Ying Sun actually used the term with some nuance by world Buddhist research. He means the undertaking of Buddhist research that is not constrained by boundaries of sectarian or lineage affiliation in which the production of Buddhist scholarship requires one to go beyond the Buddhist uh, texture transmission and by implication, the national cultural heritage that every canon is associated with. The Buddhist search for truth, both spiritual, historical truths that transcend the temporal, national, and cultural association of the researcher. Ideally, the researcher uh, should have some command of relevant canonical languages to read the canons beyond one's tradition. According to Master Ying Sun, one has to acknowledge that any set of Buddhism in the world is a branch of Buddhism. Therefore, it may not be unilaterally or arbitrarily disclaimed by any other set as not true Buddhism. And no single set can have the sole claim of pristine Buddhism. Neither should the Mahayana schools be regarded as illegitimate, nor should the Sravaka schools be looked upon as non viable seats. Only when all Buddhists will study and practice together objectively in a friendly atmosphere with mutual trust and understanding can coordination and correlation of the different sets be possible. Okay, this is the last part, my conclusion. Contemplative reading on page 83. Admittedly, the actual historical contents and findings which Master Ying Shun came up with about the history of Indian Buddhism and the development of the Buddhist Tripitaka are now dated and have been surpassed by more current scholarship on the pers uh, respective topics. What then can we learn from this journey in Tripitaka studies? Uh, I begin this study with the master's life, and in closing, I would like to return once again to his personal intellectual journey. The attitude of his, of his study, the singularity in his devotion and commitment to Tripitaka studies is evident even from my brief account of his life. In Buddhist practices, be it the sixth recollection in Theravada or Pure Lands Buddha recitation or Zen contemplation of Koan in Mahayana, they are all required the practitioner to be singularly focused ar around some chosen object of cultivation as the constant practice. In Master Insurance life, the Chinese Tripitaka serves as that kind of orienting pivot toward which his faith, aspiration, and practice are directed. His entire life practice is Tripitaka studies, and even when he undertook to construct Buddhist centers of learning, uh, of learning and practice, and when he had to lecture on administer the uh, administer the, the centers, he would always pass on the leadership and return again to his personal studies on the Tripitaka. In fact, in his book, uh, A 60-Year Spiritual Voyage, Master Ying Shun explicitly uh, presented his own study of Buddhist texts as a form of contemplation. Whether the Buddhist teaching is heard from a preacher or read in a sutra, or a sastra, one should always undertake proper contemplation. My memory is weak. Only, though, only through thinking and pondering can I deepen a mental impression. And I therefore contemplate frequently at first. Uh, the outcomes of learning always come in bits and pieces. If one just uh, studiously commits to memory things but is not at contemplating, it is merely a mechanical reading and mechanical memorizing. And even if one overcomes 
the difficulties through assiduous application once future writing becomes nothing but a scrapbook pieced together from other people's works. But if it is through contemplation, the pieces of information will become linked together, sometimes from among a heap of old knowledge, something suddenly gives rise to a new inspiration and one obtains a new insight and opens the door to other related concepts. In this passage, Master Ying Shun employed the phrase si wei or contemplation, which is precisely the term for the contemplating bodhisattva, an icon popular in East Asian Buddhist art. The reading habits of uh, a monk scholar is presented here as contemplative, uh, as a contemplative exercise, and a truly productive form of reading has to be contemplative. Only then does the monastic scholar profoundly engage the text and internalize deep insights that endow one with an overall uh, picture of the connections beyond immediate concepts. Five more minutes to wrap up. Or please. phenomena. The doctrine of no self is very much a running theme in the description of the humility with which the monk scholar searches for the truth. Master Ying Shun pointed out that his realization or understandings often would, go, would undergo substantial revisions. He described the research process. During the process of further studying, I might realize that my previous view or understanding was erroneous or imperfect. Again, through contemplation, I would revise, supplement, or uh, entirely alter my views. In some, I don't arbitrarily uh, regard my view as absolutely correct. Only after revising and revising like this, then do I build progress is built on progress, and gradually my, my thoughts become solidified. Thus, even if my understanding isn't quite a complete grasp of the issue, at the very least, it gets a part of its meaning. We have here a picture of humble monastic uh, scholar uh, whose daily uh, ruminations on issues in the text he read regularly serve as a building block towards his understanding of uh, Buddhism. Thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.